Hi, my name is Zinia Nakvi. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist. Uh, I'm from Toronto, but currently based in Montreal as I'm completing my MFA uh, at Concordia uh, in the photography department. Um, my background is mostly in photography and image-based uh, art, um, but pretty early on started to dapple with video and um, mixing mediums. I often work with archival footage. Um, I started off mostly with archival photographs and now starting to work with different archival materials and often um, using fiction and narrative in combination with the archive. Um, and yeah, my work is definitely starting to um, just be more exploratory as I'm in grad school and taking my time to really think about uh, how my practice is evolving. Um, so starting to use many different materials. Um, and yeah, so that's a bit about me. So I did my undergraduate degree um, in photography at Ryerson. And um, I think that I started becoming interested in, in photography um, as a teenager because it was like the new millennium and uh, digital photography had just started becoming popular and I was a teen and I wanted to sort of post things online and started interested in selling how I could tell stories through images. Um, and as I went through my degree, I realized that I work uh, kind of slowly and like to think about narrative um, often through family histories um, and started working with my own family archive uh, as well as other people's family archives. Um, but sometimes when I'm especially thinking about the past uh, and things that maybe occurred not only to me but to my parents, I don't always have physical documentation of that. So that's when things like fiction um, and different mediums come into play. Um, basically, like each project is for me is totally different and the medium uh, comes in usually because there's kind of some kind of gap in the story uh, that I'm trying to tell. Uh, so the different mediums come in to tell that story. Uh, with So with Vina, for example, it's loosely based off of uh, my mother's experience of moving to England when she was just married. Um, but rather than doing a straight interview with her, which I have done in the past, I kind of knew that she wouldn't tell the story exactly the way I wanted her to, so I decided to, um, to write out the story in my own words from my memory of what she had told me, um, and embellish certain details and fictionalize certain things. So it is kind of a memoir, but also it's my own interpretation. Um, and then used uh, audio software to uh, play with the idea of accents and retelling and authenticity. Um, so I'm sure we'll probably get into that more with you. But basically the different mediums that I use, uh, I always employed to further enhance the story that I'm trying to tell. So I each process of working for each project I start is pretty different. Um, I'm not someone who works very well in isolation or even in the studio that well. Um, I need to feed off of other people, so working collaboratively in that sense uh, is nice. Like I need to be in my own space sometimes, but at the same time I also get a little sad <laughs> when I'm like completely alone. And being back in school has been really nice because as I'm working through a project, I do definitely need to uh, discuss it with people as I'm going along. So having peers and teachers uh, that I can feed off of has been really integral. Um, and I usually kind of start bit by bit uh, with the project, receiving feedback, even when I wasn't in school, um, seeking out studio visits from different people who work similarly or might have something similar uh, in the way they work in their practice is always really vital for me. But yeah, I can't really say I have a set way of working or, or any rituals like that because each project is so different. <laughs> and a lot of it just kind of happens in my head uh, as I'm going along. So Vina uh, was an interesting project for me. It was something, the physical formation of Vina as an installation 
uh, started when I was at school um, in undergrad and actually it was an assignment uh, to work with projection, projection image. Uh, so I took, I was just playing around kind of with installation techniques and I had never done an installation before. Um, but I wanted to work with projection and a surface uh, that would really um, activate uh, the projection. So I decided to take a video portrait of a friend uh, who was at school with me, uh, who was also of Indian descent. Um, and I projected onto this sort of curtain that I created of 10 uh, saris. Um, and originally I had another audio to go with the piece that was audio of my father speaking about his memories of his mother um, uh, wearing saris when he was young. Um, and this was actually received pretty well uh, from my teachers and my peers, but I became very conscious of the fact that my father was speaking in Urdu in this dialogue. Uh, which is like our language that we speak in. So nobody could understand the dialogue. It was just kind of this added audio texture um, that made the piece very nostalgic. And uh, people were really, really sort of entranced by the beauty of the fabric with this image of this beautiful woman on top. And I just kind of felt like the piece was being read at a very surface level because people couldn't really understand or actually engage with the content of the work. They were just really enthralled with the physical uh, formation that came out of it. Um, and for me, beauty has always been something I've been very skeptical of in my work, um, just as a South Asian artist. Um, and I'm very aware of kind of my, uh, my work and also the bodies, sort of brown bodies that may or may not be in my work, the way that they are seen. And I'm also very sort of preoccupied, I guess, with uh, people taking the work and, and my work and me and my concepts seriously. Um, so I wanted to kind of play with these ideas of beauty and nostalgia. So for the second iteration of the work, which I had installed uh, for the first time in Montreal here, last year, um, I created an audio, a different audio piece uh, to go with the installation. So the physical formation of it was the same, but I had written this, uh, this text, like I mentioned, which was sort of an adapted version of uh, my mom's experience moving to uh, England after she was uh, married. But rather than using a straight um, interview audio, I decided to um, write it out with my memory of her, uh, what she had said, and sort of embellish certain details and fictionalize other things so that it was her story but also kind of my story, and maybe exaggerate points of uh, racism or discomfort that she wouldn't actually tell me because she probably didn't really want to share those details, but these are just things I thought she might have experienced, um, things that I would probably feel if I was her at the time. Um, but the actual audio reading of the piece was done by uh, the Apple dictation settings on my laptop. Um, so I was playing around with my Mac one time and I was looking at the different accents they have for reading English. Um, and I noticed that they had an Indian uh, accent, an English, in, in, Indian English accent. Um, and I thought that was really curious, and I also felt like her accent, Veena, was the name actually of the voice uh, in my Mac, um, her accent kind of seemed the most authentic because you weren't quite sure if it was a robot or someone who's, for whom English was a second language. Um, and so I had Veena, the voice, read the piece, and then I added in certain pauses uh, that would be for breaths to make it a little bit more realistic. And I had her read the piece, and that was the sound um, as you were looking at the projection of this beautiful woman uh, onto this cascade of fabric. I'm sorry. And for the first time in your exhibition, uh, we showed the video documentation of the piece as its own piece, because in the past I've shown the actual installation in a gallery space. Um, but this is the first time that that has happened. 
um, because of the experience of the film of the piece for the viewer, but also largely for me, um, is very different because you know when I'm installing a piece in a physical space, I'm spending a lot of time with it. I'm putting it up, I'm testing out the sound, um, whereas for this work, it's, the video documentation was something that I had completed and I, I put the audio on top of it and you know, you kind of release it into the world and I'm not able to see um, the reaction uh, by uh, the viewers of it, but at the same time, they're able to see it in a more sort of mediated, um, isolated space and maybe take it in better. Um, and especially when we added the subtitles, I'm hoping that they're able to uh, understand the content of the audio a little bit better. And then of course, it kind of adds to the digitization uh, aspect that comes in. So the video documentation, which actually I think looks better than the way that you can experience it in real life, because I shot it in a dark room. Um, and the projection against the texture of the fabric is very isolated and comes through. Um, so it's a lot more actually entrancing than the way you see it uh, often in real life because if it's in the gallery space where there's lights on and other pieces around, it's not as isolated of an experience. Um, and yeah, hopefully, and then it adds to that layer of digitization because you have the digital audio um, and you're seeing it through screen sort of mediated, maybe kind of plays further with the ideas of authenticity. So false nostalgia is kind of an interesting concept for me um, in the sense that the narrative that's part of this project, um, it's my mother's story, but at the same time, if I had wanted an authentic account of my mother's story, I would have asked her for an audio interview, as I have done in the past. Um, but I specifically did not uh, ask her for that, for this project, um, and I decided to sort of recount and put together details of things that she's told me uh, throughout my life um, and create a new narrative that is has some truth to it, but is also maybe putting together uh, different inferences um, and feelings of, um, you know, encountering racism um, when she moved to a new country and things like that, which is not things that she uh, directly told me, but things that I can kind of imagine for myself um, occurred or maybe didn't occur. But this is sort of what I would imagine her experience to be based off what, it, what she has told me in the past and different sort of things. You know, parents don't always like to uh, talk about instances that were uncomfortable. Um, and I think if I was to ask her about her experience, she probably wouldn't tell me those details because they were a long time ago and, and she's, you know, thankfully sort of moved on from them. Um, but as a second generation person, um, and dealing with the similar sort of instances at a different scale here and now, I am thinking about the racism she might have faced or um, people around her might have been dealing with. So I um, chose to sort of embellish those details or exaggerate them in my narrative um, because it also ties into the um, uh, experience of wearing the sari, for example. Um, and I think this is something I'm thinking about a lot in my work in general is I tend to use uh, experiences, or in the past I have used a lot of experiences uh, of migration, um, my family's migration and, and in my work, um, but this is not something that I've directly experienced myself. Uh, so what does it mean to constantly be retelling my family's story? Um, at a certain point, it's, you know, also kind of using their story for my own work. Um, but I guess I'm also thinking about sort of ownership, like, is it really mine? Um, so these are all things that I'm thinking about in my practice. And fiction has been a way for me to kind of uh, exaggerate certain parts of the story or maybe highlight uh, certain parts that I want to think about, which may or may not also make the viewer uncomfortable, um, if that makes sense. 
Place has a huge effect uh, on my practice, and that's actually one of the reasons I chose to uh, come to study here in Demi MFA in Montreal. I was actually pretty certain that I didn't want to stay in Toronto to do that, just because I kind of felt like it was time for a bit of a change. You know, I grew up around Toronto, and and because a lot of the work um, that I do does revolve around my family, I actually wanted to move away from that a little bit just because, um, or try to, I still have, you know, use it in my own way, but, or at least kind of make my family history more of my own. Cause sometimes it kind of felt like, especially as a POC artist, it seems like you're encouraged to talk about this sort of migration history, which is not necessarily my migration reality or what I face day to day. And I wanted to kind of address uh, my own feelings uh, of things that I sort of face in my life um, and talk about that in my pra practice rather than always dealing with uh, what has happened to the past. Like I feel sometimes when I go to my parents' house and I'm like looking around it, especially because I work with archives. So every time I go through like a photo album, I'm like, oh, this is a great project. I should use this. And then I was like, well, I don't want to fall back on sort of working in the same way uh, over and over again. It's for me, especially as a young artist, it's really important to keep uh, challenging myself and the ways that I work. Um, so for now, I'm sort of always trying to uh, work in different ways, actually, um, for each project that I do. Um, and I chose to come to Montreal because it is close enough that I can go home when needed, but it's also a great distance, separation, completely different uh, art scene, different language, very different culture, um, very political scene. Um, there's a big, you know, history of activism, and I feel like being from Montreal, uh, people who are from Montreal, it's like kind of a very political existence because of um, the history of this city. And I've had an interesting time uh, talking uh, with people here about ideas, you know, nationalism and language barriers um, is a huge reality uh, of living in this place. Um, and I found all of that very interesting and it, I haven't, you know, directly uh, spoke about it in my practice, but I think it has informed it in different ways and will continue to inform it. Um, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a great, also living in the city is just so vibrant and it's very conducive for an artist because um, it's very affordable to be in school and be a student and have studio space and and the city's full of artists, so it's um, been very inspiring. And I live a very like more lax lifestyle that's really focused on my practice that I wasn't really able to do when I was in Toronto. Um, but I do miss it there a lot, so I might come back soon. You know, when I finish my degree, um, because I also have a huge community there that I really love to work with and I miss as well. So, but luckily, um, they're both close enough that I can sort of be in between the two cities and that hasn't been, it's been a challenge at times, but it's been a good challenge. And I think um, it's been important to also see how another city's arts community functions for me. And I think that's something that uh, everyone should do if they have the chance. I am in my uh, final thesis year of my MFA. Um, and my thesis project will be a film project uh, that deals with, I shot a film uh, actually for my thesis of my undergrad, um, called Sea View uh, that was shot in Karachi, Pakistan, which is where my family is from. Um, and throughout the process of making that film, there was a piece of footage uh, that I shot at the time that was a situation between my aunt and her maid, a domestic helper who worked in her home. Um, that was kind of an uncomfortable situation. And I've been thinking about this scene for a very long time. Um, since it happened, but also dealing with sort of issues of class, especially in uh, Pakistan, but also in relation to the West um, and how that kind of, for me, divides third and first world or our ideas of the third and first world. Um, so I'm going to be making a fictional film that deals with that uh, situation and these concepts. Um, it's very much in the beginning stations right now. I'm working on writing script and then hopefully getting that ball rolling, um, but I've never made a narrative film before, so it's all very new for me, so I'm a bit nervous, um, but hopefully it all goes well. Um, and then I'm teaching my first class actually at Concordia in photo 
this fall um, and we'll be doing other things sort of related to that. So it's going to be a busy year for me.